worship. And for the ladies, you're a mother. Happy Mother's Day. Welcome to worship. Uh, I understand they have a pretty corsage for the ladies. I'm not wearing one for obvious reasons. So there's <laughs> one for you, ladies. So make sure you get one. As we begin, our birthdays or anniversaries to celebrate. Okay. Sure, how many is that? 61. We got, we, got a ways, we got a ways to go to catch up. Yeah. Okay, let's honor them then. Happy anniversary, Mom. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>
Affirmation of Faith today is on page 887. 887. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? No. In all things we are more than conquerors through the one who loved us. We are sure that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. And now we'll pass around the bucket for the first part to offer. Suppose one of you has a friend, and he goes to him at midnight and says, Friend, lend me three li leaves of bread, because a friend of mine on a journey has come to me, and I have nothing to set before him. But then one of you shy answers, Don't bother me. The door is already locked, and my children are already in bed. I can't get up to give you anything. I tell you, Though he will not get up and give him the bread because he is a friend, yet because of the man's boldness, he will get up and give him as much as he needs. So, so I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. He receives Christ. Please turn to 310 in your handle. 310. We're going to sing all verses of He Lives. If you'll please stand. <coughs> Thank you. 
They wanted to give an award to the best definition of friend. And as you think about that, you can probably think of a lot of things you've heard about what a friend is. They had thousands of people respond to the contest. And the winning entry was very simple but profound. It said, a friend is one who comes when everyone else goes. I thought that was a pretty interesting definition of a friend. Well, if you look at the top of your outline there for the scripture, it said, Abraham believed God and was credited him as righteousness, and he was called God's friend. Think of that, being called God's friend. In fact, God himself said it in Isaiah 41, 8. It says, but you, O Israel, whom I have chosen, you descendants of Abraham, my friend. Imagine that. Just picture for a moment if suddenly we heard a thundering voice in the middle of a service and God himself is speaking and he says, I want you to know my friend Peggy or fill in your name. I want you to know my friend. Just imagine what it would be like to have God calling you his friend. Abraham was called God's friend. Moses was called the friend of God in the Bible. In fact, in Exodus it says, the Lord would speak to Moses face to face as a man speaks with his friend. And then moving into the New Testament, Jesus said a similar thing to the disciples. He said, I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know what his master is doing. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything I learned from my father, I've made known to you. So Jesus wants to call us friends as well. Uh, as you look at your outline there, I'm going to do the myths first. So the bottom part will be first on your outline there. But what does it mean to be a friend? Sometimes the easiest way to answer what something is, is to describe what is not. So we're going to look at five myths. What people believe about being friends with God, but it's not scripturally true. The first one is deeds. If you do good deeds for your fellow man, you give to charities, you help someone when you feel like it, uh, this will make you God's friend. But that's not what the Bible says being a friend of God is all about. Look at the next one. Someone else may say, well, I'll not only do good deeds, but I'll be a good person. I'll live by the golden rule. I'll treat people right. I'll not hurt or harm anyone. I'll really be a good person, and that will make me God's friend. But according to the Bible, that's not a definition of God's friend either. Someone else says, well, I'll not only do good deeds, and I'll not only be a good person, I'll be religious too. I'll go to church, I'll sing in the choir, I'll give offerings, I'll attend meetings. Uh, when I'm really religious, that will make me God's friend. And no, uh, that's a myth. The Bible doesn't says that's not being a friend of God either. And then someone may say, well, I'll do all those three things, and sometimes I feel really close to God. But feeling isn't the answer either. You may feel close to God when you're looking at a sunset, or when you're on the golf course, or fishing in a boat. You may feel close to God, but that doesn't make you God's friend. And then someone will say, well, I'll do all those four things. Not only that, but I will learn more and more about God. I can name the 12 apostles from memory. I can quote and tell you all 66 books in the Bible. Uh, I can tell you the names of David's mighty men. I've learned a lot about God. But it's a myth if you think that makes you God's friend. Because according to the Bible, all those are myths. You may have seen the commercial that Kroger has. And in the middle of the commercial, it, it talks about being a friend. And it says, my mom always told me, if you want to have a friend, be a friend. And I see you nodding. Some of you have seen that commercial. Um, to be a friend, you need to have a relationship. And the Bible says there's only one way to have a relationship with God. And that's through Jesus. 1 Timothy 2.5 says, 
There is only one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Jesus Christ. The Bible says the only way to be related to God, to have a relationship with God, is through Jesus. John 1.12 says, To all who received him, to them gave he the power, or right, or authority, depending on the translation, to become children of God. And what does that mean? That means when you believe that Jesus died on the cross for your sins, ask him into your heart as Savior and Lord, then you become a child of God. That starts a relationship with God. And he offers you the opportunity to be his friend. Now, if we had time and I could ask you some questions and we could dialogue a little bit, uh, I would ask you, what are the qualities you want in a friend? Think about your best friend. What are the qualities that you would want to have in a friend? Now, in Sunday school we have more time. We can discuss and we can ask questions and get answers. And uh, In fact, I invite you to come early on Sundays to Sunday school, be part of the discussion. If you've ever sat there during church, during a message, and thought, where's that in the Bible? Or what did he really mean by that? It'd be rude to stand up and interrupt the church service to ask. But in Sunday school, it's open discussion. And you can ask those questions. So I invite you to Sunday school. But think about what you want in a friend. Now, I'm sure if we had time, we'd get a lot of different answers. Some really good ones. I'm going to highlight just five things, if you look at your outline there. Just five things that you would want in a friend, and how God demonstrates that, each one of them, that he wants to be our friend. Number one is support. You want a friend to support you, to encourage you, to be there for you, to believe in you, to trust you, to expect the best of you. A man named George Danzig was a famous mathematician, and about a half a century ago, when he was in college at the University of California, finishing up his work in math, he was a brilliant student. And he arrived late for the final exam, and when he came in, he grabbed the exam paper from the professor's desk, went to his desk, and started working furiously. He quickly answered all eight of the questions on the final exam and was ready to turn it in when he looked up and he saw two other questions on the board. And so he looked back at his paper again and started, turned it over and started writing, but he couldn't finish them. And so when he, went, he, turned, when he turned in the paper, he asked the professor that if he could have some more time to do the ones on the board that he didn't get them done. And the professor smiled and said, sure, turn it in by end of class Friday. So George went home and worked all evening, late into the night, got the answer to the first one, and then he got some coffee <laughs> and something to eat and stayed up all night working on the other one. And finally, early Friday morning, he got the answer for it. And so he hurried over to the, the, to the university, to the professor's office, turned it in, and went home and just crashed and went to sleep. He was awakened on Saturday morning early by professor pounding on his door saying, George, George, wake up. I said, what? He said, you solved those two problems. He said, yeah, I turned it in at your office. The professor said, you don't understand. When I put them on the board, I told the class, these are problems, math problems, that no one has been able to solve. So if you want to have some fun during summer vacation, try solving these problems. He said, George, you solved them. George said, if I'd known that, I probably wouldn't even have tried. <laughs> but you can appreciate the value of having someone believing in you, thinking you can do something. Maybe even when you have doubts yourself, but a friend believes in you. Um, a friend encourages you. Some of you may remember Jackie Robinson, the first black man to play professional Major League Baseball. And when he broke the color barrier, Whenever he would come out on the field, in every, in every city they played, he'd be booed. The crowd would boo him in every city. And even in his hometown of Brooklyn, uh, when he came out on the field, they booed him. And then one, one time during a game, he made a, a mistake, an error, and 
the booze really started. And right in the middle of everything, his friend was, uh, Pee Wee Reese was playing shortstop. And Reese left his shortstop position, went over and stood beside him, put his arm around him like this, and, and then waved to the crowd. And suddenly the booze stopped, and slowly the cheers started, and applause started, and the crowd that had been booing him started cheering him, and probably saved his major league career because of the encouragement of a friend. And you can be that type of a friend for someone, to encourage him, like the contest winner in the London newspaper said, to be one who comes when everyone else goes. God shows his friendship for us that way. In Isaiah, he said, Do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed. I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Picture God putting his right arm around you, saying, This is my friend, and encouraging you. In fact, one of the names for God in the New Testament 2 Thessalonians 2.16. One of the names of God is the eternal encourager. Think of that. The eternal encourager. Think of a time when you need an encouragement. God is there. Never leaves us. Never forsakes us. Always there to encourage us. What does it mean to be a friend of God then? To be available for him. To support his work. When something needs to be done, to be like Isaiah and say, here am I. Not like Moses who said, here am I, send Aaron. But to present yourself and be available for God, just like he's available for us. And how can we do that even if we don't see God? Jesus said, do it for one of the least of these, my brothers. Do it for someone else. Encourage someone, just like you would encourage God. Number two, something you'd want in a friend, sacrifice. You know God made the ultimate sacrifice for us when he laid down his life for us. And Jesus said, greater love has no one than this, that he laid down his life for his friends. A man named Brian Chappell tells of something that happened in his hometown as he was growing up that he always remembered. He said two boys were out playing on the sand dunes near the river, and as they were running down one of the sand dunes, their weight caused the sand to shift, and they quickly began sinking in the sand, and later, hours later, when the parents came looking for the two boys, uh, they saw the youngest one, uh, buried in the sand with just his head and shoulders above the sand, unconscious. And when they revived him and began digging him out, and they asked, where's your brother? He said, I'm standing on his shoulders. The older brother had made a sacrifice. Greater love has no one than this, and a man lays down his life for his friends. The older brother gave up his own life to save his to save the younger brother. <coughs> a friend will sacrifice. God may not call you to be like a Mother Teresa and go work with the homeless in another country, but he calls each one of us to do something. So the question is, what sacrifice are we willing to make to be a friend of God? Another thing that a friend will do, sharing and communicating especially communicating the gospel. Friends talk to each other. Can you imagine having a friend that would never talk with you? That would be too busy to listen to you? To spend time with you? Remember the verse that said, The Lord would speak to Moses face to face as a man speaks with his friend. God says, if you talk, I'll listen. In fact, uh, your Bible quiz today, what's God's phone number? Jeremiah 3.3. 3. He says, when you call, I will answer. Um, 
He spoke with he spoke with Moses face to face. If you had the privilege of spending time with God and hearing his voice, you know what it's like. It's one thing to know that God hears you. It's another thing to know that he'll speak to you as well. Whether you call it revelation or inspiration or whatever you call it, just the ability to hear from God. That's an important quality of friendship. And the Bible talks about speaking the truth in love, communicating with friends. Um, not that we have to beat them over the head with a Bible or quote Bible verses to them all the time or something like that, but to just gently communicate the love of God to them. Quite a few years ago, there was a famous Olympic diver named Charles Murray. He had a roommate named Kevin who was a Christian. And Kevin would often, when they talked, share the gospel with him and tell him how much God loved him. And one day he, he called Charles and said, hey, do you want to get together for coffee? I got some Bible verses I'd like to share with you. And Charles said, oh no, I'm busy. I got to practice for the Olympics. And so later that evening, about 10.30, uh, I said, Charlie went to the pool to practice. And there's a lot of <coughs> moonlight coming in through the skylight. He didn't even bother to turn the lights on. He just climbed up 20 feet up the high dive to the ladder there. And he said as he got ready to dive, and as he spread his arms out like this, he said the light coming through the skylight behind him, he looked up at the wall, and there on the wall was the shape of a cross. His body made the shape of a cross on the wall. And he said suddenly he remembered everything that Kevin had said to him about how much God loved him and about the sacrifice that Jesus had made for him on the cross. And he said it just sort of all came together then right there for him. And he said he knelt down right on the high dive board and repented of his sins, invited Jesus into his life as Savior and Lord. And he said when he finished, as he got up, he said the janitor came in, turned on the lights, and then he realized something. The pool that he was about to jump into had been green for repairs. If he had jumped, he would have jumped to his death. He said later, God saved him twice that night, both physically and spiritually. But a friend had shared with him, a friend had communicated the gospel, told him how much God loved him. Hadn't pushed it, but it shared. That's what a friend will do. Remember, Jesus says, I no longer call you servants. A servant doesn't know his master's business. But I called you friends. For everything that I've learned from the Father, I've made known to you. God communicates with us. The question is, are we communicating with him? Like he would want us to do as friends. Number four, another quality you want in a friend, similar interests. I used to, before my knees rebelled, I used to play a lot of racquetball. I loved playing racquetball. And on some days of the week, I'd be in leagues, but there were a couple <coughs> days of the week when uh, anybody that showed up at the club, we'd all just gather around, just pair off in twos or threes and just play each other. And on one of those days, you never knew who you were going to be playing with, but on one of those days, um, I met Doug. And so we went over to the corner and started playing racquetball. And I soon learned he was the worship leader at Christ the King Church. And that was one of the best days of racquetball I ever had. I mean, we were evenly matched in racquetball. We had a lot of fun with racquetball. But we also had a lot to talk about. We both loved the Lord. We both loved the worship. And we not only played racquetball, but we shared together, we prayed together when we were done, uh, prayed for the Lord's blessing on each other in the ministries. Uh, it was just a wonderful time. We not only shared a love for racquetball, but a love for the Lord. When you're with someone with similar interests that loves the same things that you do, there's a special friendship that takes place there. And the Bible talks about walking with God and one of the best secrets I found to walking with God is the whole scripture in Galatians 5.25. It says, since we live by the Spirit, let's keep in step with the Spirit. If you've ever tried to walk with someone who was bigger and faster or smaller and slower than you, um, 
you know it's not always easy to keep in step with people. Uh, sometimes, sometimes they want to run ahead or lag behind. Sometimes they get distracted. Sometimes they might want to run off on a side trip. Uh, but if we want to walk with God, like the Bible says, to keep in step with the Spirit, to listen to what the, what the Holy Spirit of God is saying to us. Someone said, it's hard to walk with someone if you're not going to the same place. That's another one of those similar interest things. To walk with someone, to keep in step with them. God is willing to walk with us. That in itself is amazing. The infinite, <coughs> immortal, eternal God of the universe is willing to spend time with us and walk with us. The question is, are we willing to walk with him? Number five, another quality that's important, submission. The desire to put others ahead of yourself and to please them. Someone put it this way. Uh, the Bible says to, well, let me read the scripture first. <coughs> Philippians 2, 3. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourself. And I like what one, one person said about it. When you consider others less than yourself, it generates jealousy and envy and bitterness. When you consider others equal with yourself, it generates competition and criticism. But when you consider others higher than yourself, it generates cooperation and working together. When you have a good friend, you want to please them. You want to help fulfill their desires and their goals. And listen to what the Bible says, how God fulfills that with us. The Bible says, God satisfies your desires with good things. His power has given us everything we need for life and godliness. God wants to bless us. All through the scripture, we see that God wants to bless people who trust in him. Now what's our part? There's an interesting scripture in Ephesians 5.10. It says this, find out what pleases the Lord and do it. That's a pretty good challenge. Find out what pleases the Lord and do it. As you look through the Bible, you see good examples of people who please the Lord. Enoch, by walking with God. Mary, in the New Testament, by sitting at his feet and listening. Abraham, by true worship and obedience and believing God. David, with a heart after God. Jesus, who said he was always pleasing the Father. Paul, with his praying. Some of the prayers of Paul are some of the greatest prayers in the Bible that we can pray. In all these things, looking for ways to please God and do it. And part of it, like Abraham, was obedience. It's, it's sort of like obeying the rules for something. Uh, one of my neighbors has a John Deere tractor, or a lawnmower, and he very proudly scoots that thing around his yard, and, and the neighbors all look because they know that's an expensive mower and it's really good. And, and he loves riding that John Deere mower around his yard but, you know, that mower came with an instruction book with it and an owner's manual on how to operate it. Now, I like chocolate syrup, but imagine if he would go out there and pour a big jug of chocolate syrup into the gas tank. Now, everyone knows chocolate syrup is better than gasoline, right? Yeah. It tastes better. It's better on ice cream. Uh, there's a lot of good uses for chocolate syrup. But being poured in a gas tank of his John Deere is not one of them. The John Deere wouldn't operate that way. The Bible is sort of an owner's manual for us. Sort of an instruction manual for us as believers. And when we try to do something that's contrary to that, there's problems. Things don't work the way they should. As you think about being a friend of God, I want you to think, first of all, about two things about God. One, it's not a new thing. I want you to think of how much God loves you. 
how much God loves you. And he wants to be your friend. The eternal, immortal, invisible, all-knowing God of the universe loves you and wants to be your friend. And then he's made it possible to be your choice to be God's friend. And it starts with a relationship. The only way to have a relationship with God is through Jesus. It starts with that. And then by finding out what pleases him and doing it, like the Bible says, we can become a friend of God. John Maxwell always said, he used to do a lot of talking when he prayed, but then he thought about it one day, and he said, on one hand, we have the infinite, immortal, eternal, all-knowing God of the universe who knows everything. And on the other hand, we have a mortal human being. Who's going to learn the most by listening? Think about it. He said, since that time, I've done a lot more listening in my praying than I have talking. <clears throat> There's no question about God wanting to be our friend. There's no question that we can depend on God. The only question is, can God depend on us? Are we willing to be a friend of God? Before I pray, I want to give you an opportunity to share any prayer requests or reports or testimonies that you may have this morning. Anyone with a prayer request or a report? I have a new great-granddaughter. That's a good report. She was born yesterday. Her name's Amelia. Or Emily. I don't know. I don't know. Anyway, she weighed 7 pounds, 13 ounces. Head full of hair, and she called me. So I want my baby get to go home today. Very good. Any other reports or requests? A prayer yes. for my friend, Pastor Sharon. Here. He, uh, he's having some problems. Not here, but it's a good prayer. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Another good quality of friendship. Praying for someone. Very good. Okay, any other requests or reports? Okay, let's pray. Our Father, I thank you that even as we were speaking these requests, even as some are unspoken but being thought of in their hearts right now, you hear each one. You know us perfectly, and you communicate with us not only by listening, but by speaking to us, sharing with us, and by orchestrating the events of our lives. So, Father, I trust you right now to minister perfectly in each one of these situations, wherever there's a need. We ask you to be the answer to that need, to minister perfectly, to, to supply strength and counsel, encouragement, wisdom, revelation, healing, whatever is needed. I ask you to minister perfectly by the power of your Holy Spirit. Father, I thank you for your invitation to us to be your friend and all that that means, even beyond our imagination, being a friend of God. Thank you, Lord. We thank you for that in the name of Jesus, our Savior and our friend, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name.
friend of God, our generation, us older kids, have a song called What a Friend We Have in Jesus. It all talks about the friendship with God. Let's uh, stand and sing the hymn, Wonderful Words of Life, number 600.